Everything in our relationship with the Holy Spirit is about discovering and manifesting the resurrected Christ. Everything is connected because without the resurrection, there is no forgiveness of sin. It is all connected to the resurrection. Thanks. Wow. Well, happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Boy, isn't that the truth? Scripture says that without the resurrection, we can't be born again. We, can't, we actually can't be saved. Everything hinges upon that one thing. And the complete uh, victory that Jesus had over sin, over powers of darkness, over the grave. Wow, wow, wow. So, so significant. So we'll talk about that today. Brief update on my wife. By the way, to all our online community, we love you. So thankful for you. Thank you that you join us week after week. And the overflow rooms. Bless all of you in the overflow you know, we used to have this manifestation of the glory that would appear in the room. And we actually had it happen 26 times in a period of about 11 months. But I remember one time it started in the overflow. So it kind of makes me want to go hang out over there. So all of you overflow people, bless you. We're, we're thankful. Uh, just quick update. Appreciate so much um, all the great numbers of people that have been praying for my wife. Uh, we're so thankful. Uh, her white, they got her white blood count uh, up, so she was able to receive treatment. She got shingles, so the pain level has been pretty nasty. So we're, we're fighting against that, that ornery thing right now. But, uh, uh, but very thankful for the prayers, thankful for all that Jesus has accomplished. You know, I, I, we, we quote verses a lot uh, to each other. And, uh, and I actually just minister to ourselves with these scriptures. <clears throat> but one of them is about the Holy Spirit. Uh, who raised Jesus from the dead, gives life to your mortal bodies. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, that the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. Here's the deal. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of resurrection. And everything you will ever learn in this New Testament life is through the Holy Spirit, and it is always to reveal the resurrected Christ. Everything is connected to the resurrection. Yes, amen, Bill. Amen. Everything is connected to the resurrection. It is so central. This, I don't understand this, but I, I'm fascinated by it. The blood of Jesus is what wipes out sin. And yet it says without the resurrection, there's no forgiveness. It was the resurrection that validated the sacrifice of his blood. That was worth the morning, whether you realize it or not, it really was. All right. Open your, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 16. And um, we're going to do something I, I, I've, only, I've only done in my t life twice that I know of. And it was the previous two services. So <laughs> <laughs> we're actually going to study a, a chapter. I don't think I've done that before unless it was a tiny, tiny chapter. Just be thankful we're not doing Psalms 119. Or we'd be here till Friday. <clears throat> I, I want to, uh, we're going to talk through uh, Mark chapter 16. If you have a Bible, please open, because I want you to be able to follow along. There are so many different portions of Scripture that add elements of insight, unique perspectives on the resurrection. I don't always talk about um, the theme uh, of, of a holiday you know, whether it be Easter or Christmas or whatever, but I, I really have wanted to, and I've been doing it more lately. I'm trying to learn to be a good pastor, really, is what it comes down to. You know. <clears throat> um, but I, I really have, have uh, it's been in my heart to talk to you about the resurrection. So we've got a number of things that we'll be going through. Let's go ahead and begin with Mark 16. We'll start with verse one. We're gonna read the first eight verses, and then we'll stop and talk, all right? Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw the stone had been rolled away. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right hand, or the right side, and they were alarmed. And they said, he said to them, do not be alarmed. 
You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Those two phrases are potent. He is risen. He is not here. Why don't you say that with me? He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. Go tell. Anybody glad that sometimes he isolates you? He, he's not saying Peter wasn't one of the disciples. He was just saying, Peter needs a little extra help right now because he was pretty vigorous in his denying that he ever knew me. So I'm going to give him a little bonus time here, all right? So go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. And they went out quickly, fled from the tomb. They trembled and were amazed and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. All right, verse seven, go tell his disciples. Verse eight, they trembled and said nothing. <laughs> the first evangelist hit a wall. <laughs> you know, this is, uh, the gospel of John adds some uh, elements to this story that I love so much. One is that when, um, when Peter and John actually ran to the tomb. They got there apparently after uh, Mary. But when they got to the tomb, there was an angel at the, there was a kind of a stone bed where they would lay the body. There was an angel at the foot and there was an angel at the head. And there, they saw the grave clothes folded uh, where his body used to be. And then the napkin over his head was folded and placed in a separate place. And there's this Jewish tradition that when, if you ever went to somebody's home for a meal, and it was, there were certain, there were certain ways you could respond. If you ever went to a home where there was a meal and it was an absolutely disgusting meal, there was a certain way you could fold the napkin, leave it on your plate so that when you left, they would look at it and they would know, you will never eat that meal again. <laughs> and Jesus tasted death and it was folded and it was left where his body once lay. And he was declaring, I will never taste of death again. That was a once and for all meal. The angels at the foot and at the head remind me a lot of the tabernacle or uh, the, the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant. Thank you, somebody help me here. Ark of the Covenant that was in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, there was this golden box that they would have in the Holy of Holies, in this place before the Lord, uh, where the presence of God, the presence of God wasn't there symbolically. Literally, the manifested presence of God was upon this golden box. On this box was an angel at one side, cherubim, and one at this side, and they would face each other. In the middle was what was called a mercy seat. Inside this Ark of the Covenant, it was also called the Ark of the Testimony. It was the box that contained the record of testimony. What was in it? The tablets of stone, the revealed will of God, the um, jar of manna, the covenant of his continuous provision, and an almond rod that was dead, that is now alive with sprouts, buds, blossoms, and ripe almonds, which is how God marks his leadership. His leadership is always marked with resurrection life. So he's got this threefold testimony inside this Ark of the Covenant. And the, um, the mercy seat is on top of it, which tells me every time we share our testimony, anytime we share with somebody else the word of the Lord that God has spoken to our life, we actually usher in the mercy seat into that environment that they can taste for themselves the mercy of God. Stories are always to produce the mercy of God in a given environment. And here we have the cherubim uh, on one side of the ark and on the other side, I'd like to suggest to you that the angel at the head and at the feet is the, the eternal testimony of that Ark of the Covenant, where the mercy of God is on display through the resurrection of Christ. Let's, uh, let's move on to verse nine. When he arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept, 
And when they heard it, that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Read verses 10 and 11 with me again. Let's look at this. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard it, he was, that he was alive, had been seen by her, they did not believe. <clears throat> Mary Magdalene had seven demons cast out of her. In John's gospel, this particular story is fascinating to me because Jesus, he died and he goes into the place of the dead. Luke 16 describes two compartments of the place of the dead. There's the place of torment and there is the place of comfort. Place of comfort is called, titled Abraham's bosom. Who's Abraham? He is the father of faith. This describes the level playing field of Old Testament and New Testament believers. It's all, everybody's saved by faith, never by works, always by faith. Old and New Testament alike. So Jesus went, when he died, he went in to broadcast to those who had, were in the place of comfort. They were in the place of peace, although they couldn't go to heaven because they weren't born again. The blood hadn't been shed until that death on the cross. When Jesus died, he descended into that place of the dead and he made the proclamation, and I do want to see the video on this. He made the proclamation, the price has been paid. And they all, oh goodness, can you imagine the celebration? They all received gladly that their sins have been atoned for and permanently wiped off the slate. And they are, uh, elsewhere it says, he led captive a host of captives. So here are the captives. They were captives of the enemy through death. He's now the captives of life. And he takes them and he begins to ascend to the Father. As he's ascending to the Father, he looks over and he sees Mary Magdalene. John's gospel gives us this story. She's weeping at the tomb because Jesus isn't there and she wants to know who stole his body. And so she's there weeping and Jesus sees her and he stops the whole procession. How do we know this? Because he tells her, I've not ascended to the Father yet. So it's like he's somewhere in between the place of the dead, leading captive a host of captives on his way to the Father and he's moved by the love and affection of one. And he stops he stops what all of heaven has been waiting for, for ages. He stops it so that he can take one moment so with whom to spend with this woman out of whom he had cast seven demons. Yeah. Stunning. This is personally where I think in Matthew's gospel it says that some of the righteous dead in Jerusalem were seen walking around so I think it's when Jesus said, hold on a moment, I'll be right back. And he comes over to talk to Mary and you know, David's going, hey, we might as well catch a few sights. See, I wonder if the old house is there and they're seen walking around and then Jesus spends his time with Mary. Mary's weeping and, and he, he speaks to her. She thinks it's the gardener. And supposing it's the gardener, she turns to him and says, do you know where they've laid him? Where they put him? I want to attend to his body. She's there to put spices, etc. on him. I want to attend to him. And, and uh, she doesn't recognize him when she turns to him. And then he says, Mary. <laughs> oh, Jesus. When he said Mary, all confusion all morning, everything that was competing for her attention and affection just immediately dissolved as she saw the one yes. that she was, there to, she was there for. In that moment, she sees him. John's gospel says, Jesus says to her, stop clinging to me. I haven't gone to the father yet. So that tells me he was, she was clinging to him. Yes? yes? <laughs> Jesus was born of a virgin, Mary. Jesus was also the firstborn of the dead. In his virgin birth, the first one to embrace him was the Virgin Mary. In his second birth from the dead, the first to embrace him was Mary Magdalene, out of whom was cast seven demons. The first closed out the law. The second inaugurated the hour of grace. Verse 10 and 11, once again, they, 
uh, she went and told those who had been with him, and they mourned. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. There's kind of an unhealthy approach that, that many have I, I, uh, to, uh, to avoid mourning. I think it comes from a good place. I think it's because we want to be strong or we want to illustrate faith or whatever it might be. But there's this denial of bad things happening to good people and how you have to sort through that. And here we have disciples who are in mourning. And because of the mourning, they did not believe. Here's the warning. Mourning will either take you to unbelief or to the comforter. Yeah. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourning either takes you into a divine encounter where you become healed from the problem and you become equipped to be a problem solver. He doesn't just bring us out of the red. He takes us into the black, if that makes sense. He doesn't just take us out of the pain of a problem. He doesn't just take us out of the bad memory of a situation, but he takes us into a redemptive solution where we become the very messengers of the life that once tried to destroy us. You see it in Isaiah 61. Those, the brokenhearted, the, the blind, the lame, the, all, all the broken people, the first part. And it says, and they will rebuild the ancient ruins. The very ones that were uh, about to be despised and rejected by society become restored by King Jesus. And in that place, they become the rebuilders. That's what's happening here. Is in our mourning. Mourning, mourning is a skill. <laughs> to do it well. Because it requires honesty and abandonment. Honesty, because you, you have to be honest about what you're experiencing. This didn't seem fair. This didn't seem right. I thought this would happen. This promise was given to me. I've experienced all this disappointment. It's got to be honesty, number one. But number two, there has to be abandonment to the one who is trustworthy. There has to be a point in which I say, I don't know what's going on here but I give myself to you completely because you're the only one that is absolutely, perfectly trustworthy. Yes. And I yes. trust you. Yes. There is a point where in mourning, tears are welcome. There's not a problem with that. Um, what you don't want to do is be like these disciples who in this particular case, their mourning led them to a rigidity where they couldn't receive truth. Let's read farther, because this will make more sense, I hope, I hope, in a moment. All right. Verse 14. Later, he appeared to the 11, Jesus, appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had been seen by him after he had risen. Let's read it again. Verse 14. Later, he appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Now, here's, here's something I think we'd all agree on. None of us, we don't want to be gullible. You know, we don't want to fall. We've all heard people boast in certain things that we found out later were not true. You know, they had this vision, this whatever, this promise. It just didn't happen. None of us want to be gullible. It would be cruel of the Lord for, for him to require me to believe any report I heard, I've heard if there wasn't something in the report that caused me to know its source. The source was God or the source was not. <clears throat> In Jesus' second most famous sermon, his most famous was Sermon on the Mount. Second one was John 6, eat my flesh, drink my blood. <laughs> nobody bought the podcast after that one. <laughs> after that one. No, nobody sent that to their mother-in-law and said, listen to this one. <clears throat> At the end of this, this message, we've got perhaps 15, maybe even as many as 20,000 people that are there because he's multiplied food, extraordinary miracles, and then he stands up to preach and he decided to take a little different twist because his other sermons weren't quite so offensive. But this one, he nailed them. You have to eat my flesh, drink my blood. They start complaining, so he turns it up a notch. It's every time they started complaining, he would just make it more challenging, you know? It's great, it's John chapter six. But by the time we get to the end, everybody is left but the disciples. 
And Jesus turns to the 12 and he says, are you guys leaving too? Now, Peter got it right on several occasions. We need to give him credit. <clears throat> and he nailed it on this one. He said, where are we gonna go? You have the words of eternal life. Listen to what he's saying. Where are we gonna go? Every time you talk, we come alive inside. Let me put it in my words. We don't understand the sermon on eating flesh and drinking blood any more than the masses that left. But what we do know is when you talk, we find out why we're alive. Because there was something in the words. And Jesus later described it in chapter six. He says, my words to you are spirit. So number one, it's presence. Number two, it's life. He gives life. So there is life to the words that come from the Lord. And there's presence. When we become a people that recognize what God is saying and doing by recognizing the life from the words and the presence that becomes manifest, then we can accept the something new that he decides to do. Verse 12, it says, he appeared in another form to the two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they didn't believe them either. He appeared in another form. He didn't come like they expected. We all love the promise. God's about to do a new thing. We just hope he does it the way he did it last time. Everybody I know is crying out for a great move of God. They just want it to happen, you know, with some familiarity to it, you know. And the Lord has this habit of not only repeating the testimony, but adding to it through something, one more additional thing that is offensive to the, it, it is, to the, you know, when he added tongues, that offended a lot of people. He, he just, he, 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 he won't violate his word, but he doesn't mind violating my understanding of his word. Yeah. Yeah. I personally think he delights in it. I can't prove it. <laughs> just my personal opinion. So here we have this story where the disciples are disappointed. They're in great pain. Why? They've given three and a half years of their life to somebody who's now dead and they've got nothing to show for it. They left everything to follow this one. Intense disappointment, great mourning, why? Because they loved him. They loved him, they were devoted to him and he is now gone. Somebody comes along with news that's too good to be true. Sometimes it's true because it is too good to be true. Yeah, exactly. wow. Comes with the news that he is alive, but they are so much in pain and not wanting to be gullible. They've already left everything to follow him three and a half years ago. They don't want to do that again. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are you with me? Yeah. I don't want to be gullible. And so what happens when you try to protect yourself from being gullible, you will overcompensate and keep yourself from faith. Wow. You can either have dignity or you can have faith. You can, <laughs> you can either have dignity, you can either work to preserve your, your dignity, or you can give yourself to faith. And here's why Jesus could rebuke and correct them for not believing the report, because when the report was spoken, presence and life was released. Yeah. But they were so anxious, they become unavailable, became unavailable to what God was actually doing. Anxiety causes me to lose track of the tools that God has put in my life. Anytime we're in a situation, challenging situation, if the enemy works hard to make us mindful of, if I could use Peter in the boat, uh, walking on the water, make us mindful of the waves, make us mindful of the threats to our safety so that I take my eyes off the one safe place onto all the other possibilities. And in that, that anxiety, suddenly I can't remember one thing God's taught me in the last two years. And yet there's not a person in this room that is not facing something for which God has not already prepared you. 
He, listen, to think you're unprepared is to call him a bad steward of your life. Just because you can't remember it doesn't mean he didn't put it there. And it's fighting for that place of peace, fighting for that place of acknowledged presence. In that place is where you rediscover what God has placed there. That is the very tool, the very instrument that is needed for this next assignment. Come on. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> Our job is to recognize when a word comes from the Lord or not. I remember there, there, was a, there was a gal here. I, I want to be very careful. She had some uh, mental issues, so I, I, I need to be careful. But uh, she would accuse me of weird things. It was just, we had issues. <clears throat> but I would love her, but I just didn't want to be close. I love her from a distance. A hug, but please don't accuse me again. I mean, what she accused me of was just horrible. But she, it was in her mind. She made it up. She said she saw it right here in public, and it's just crazy. I'll never forget Sunday. It was right back where that camera is, right there. She came up to me with the word of the Lord again. But this time, it was. See, our responsibility is to recognize the word of the Lord. Our responsibility is not the approval of the messenger or the personality through which the message was given. That's good. Oftentimes, our hunger is tested by him putting what we are hungry for in the group of people or the individual that we want nothing to do with. That's the good news. <laughs> Because, just follow me now, because presence is released in those divine moments where a word is shared, it is the responsibility of the hearer to say, all right, he's on this. I'll, I'll need to figure out what he's saying exactly to me, but I recognize this is a divine moment. I'm the head of my household. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. I am. I am. My wife is the neck. She, she turns me any way she wants. <laughs> and as the head of my household, my responsibility is to recognize the word of the Lord when we hear it. Sometimes it comes to me. Sometimes it would even come from my children. Obviously, many times through my wife. <clears throat> but I remember a certain time in my life pastoring in Weaverville, I was pretty certain that it was the will of God for me to have a new car. <laughs> I, was, I, was pretty, I was pretty certain. And I was pretty certain I knew which car it was too, <laughs> since I had been shopping in the magazines. You know, we didn't have the internet then, but shopping, in, and I found the one, I'd seen it, I thought, well, that, it just looks nice. It's a good car. So I had scheduled a time for Benny and me and the kids to come down to Reading and to test drive this car. But before I left Weaverville, the Lord spoke very clearly to me in no uncertain terms. You are not to buy a car. I thought, but I should probably test drive one just so that if it ever becomes your will, we know which one to get. Yeah, we all know God needs a lot of help on these things. Yeah, yeah. So I, so I, I talked myself into it and, and dulled down that conviction to stay away. <clears throat> so we got down to the car lot and I, I get in the driver's seat. Salesman is here. My family's in the back. Start the car. And Brian starts singing. 
Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. I would have turned the car off right then, but I had to do something for the sake of the salesman. So I drove around the block, that one tiny block, back in, parked it, turned the key off, said, thank you very much, and we left. Worst test drive ever. I couldn't tell you one thing about that car because it was ruined. Might as well had John the Baptist in the back seat prophesying to me. A child's voice with all of heaven behind it saying, be careful, little eyes, what you see. I remember when I, I, two weeks ago, I talked to you a little bit about some of my personal story. And I remember <clears throat> um, in February of 1995, I made my first trip of many to Toronto. Toronto is a place where there was a mighty, mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It still continues, but it spread uh, diversely, really, all over the world right now. The critics of the revival would say, well, where are all the souls if it was a revival? Well, just from three people that I know that were dramatically touched in that revival, they've each led over a million people each to the Lord. That's just three people that I know. There's countless millions of people have come to Christ. The story goes on and on and on. But it was a very unusual visitation of God. First, one of the things that made people so mad is that people were laughing that didn't deserve it. Isn't that kind of what grace is? <laughs> anyway, I, so I, I went, I went the, the first night. You have to get there early. I mean, my goodness, sometimes you stand out in the snow early morning, five o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, and you stand there for hours waiting to get in, freezing. I mean, people would just wait forever to get into these. They're just hungry from all over the world. And I remember getting there the first night, and I sat somewhere back over, like in that section of the building, and and uh, it's quite a while before, you know, you get there an hour, two hours before the meeting starts. And it's quite a while before the meeting starts. But there's already 5,000 people there. And there's so much stuff going on in the room. The meeting hasn't even started. I mean, you got people falling on the floor and laughing and crying and got everything you can think of going on in that room. And it was sensory overload. Now, I could look at any individual and say, I'd seen that before, I'd seen that before, but I'd never seen 5,000 of that before. And it was, honestly, it was, it was overwhelming to me. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't thinking of running out. I just, I didn't know what to do with it. And I was just trying to sort through, God, I've been hearing that this is you. What's going on here? So I stood, I actually stood, uh, I, I, people are all over the place. I stood in front of my chair and I just stood there just like this. I looked around, saw all that was going on and I just closed my eyes. And as soon as I did, I recognized, oh, okay, this is the same presence, the same glory yeah. that we've been experiencing at home. Yes. What's the point? He will appear differently yeah. and you have to adjust to him. He doesn't adjust to you. Yeah. Yeah. So good. But the safeguard is he will let you know him by presence and by life that you can recognize the source of a, of a word, of a, a miracle, a, 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 an action, an activity, whatever it might be, a group of people, you recognize the source. Why? Because you could recognize, all right, this is the one I've been meeting with for these years. This is the life I've been feeding. Every time I read this word, this is the life that I feel coming off the pages of this book. It's here as this person shares this story with me. He didn't set us up to fail. He didn't set us up to fall into some deception through being gullible. What he did is he set us up for life, but he said, you'll have to learn to recognize it this way. It won't be because I keep doing the same thing the same way. It will be that when I do something new, you'll know it's me because you'll know me. You know, I'm the one that came into the room. I'm the one that spoke that word that brought such life to your soul. In that sermon, of Jesus is eat my flesh, drink my blood. Peter, are you going to leave too? Where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. In other words, you're saying stuff we don't understand, but we still feel life in our soul whenever you talk. 
That's the point is, is that I can be in a moment of conflict. I can be in a moment of confusion. I can be in a moment where I don't have a clue what in the world's going on. But whenever he speaks, life is stirring up inside of me. I find out why I'm alive. There's the confirmation I'm at the right place at the right time. I may not know what to do, but I don't need to at this moment. All I need to know now is the source of that word. And the source of that word is that comes from the throne room of God. And he's given us the protection to not fall into deception. And it's not because of our intelligence. It's because of our recognition of a person. Learn to recognize the person. All right, let's finish the chapter. Verse 15, he said to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. I like that it says every creature, not that I intend to lead uh, the mule deer to the Lord before they're harvested. <laughs> that was rather brutal. Sorry, somebody else. Um, it's that God actually plans on healing the planet. Yes. Yes. He actually values this planet. Yes, he does. After he made everything, everything he made, he said, it's good. Yeah. And after he made you, he said, ah, it's very good. He, he recognized the quality of his own work and everything that he made. And his desire isn't to destroy it. His desire is to revive and to renew. And the gospel that we carry is supposed to encompass a vision to bring healing to a planet. If only the unbeliever has the vision for taking care of the planet, they will always make it a God. <clears throat> if only the unbeliever carries the message of bringing healing to a planet, then it will serve the creation and not the creator. The church must recover our assignment. Not in, in, uh, in contempt, not in... Uh, you know, not in a, a fight, but just stewarding what God has given to us. Preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Don't ever underestimate the power of water baptism. He who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink anything deadly, like coffee, it will by no means hurt them. Thank you, Lord. Grace was extended over coffee. It will by no means hurt them. <clears throat> they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Stop right there for a minute. I was, yesterday I was uh, uh, looking at, uh, actually listening to a, uh, a YouTube video, but it was just audio. There was nothing to watch on uh, John Wesley, on somebody reading out of his personal journal. And he was, I, I don't remember all the details, but he was extremely sick, very, very ill. <clears throat> and he, this verse came to mind that these signs will follow those who believe. Now, John Wesley is the father of the whole Methodist movement. He has this verse come to mind. These signs will follow them who believe. And he prays and he experiences a bizarre supernatural healing of something that was derailing him from his uh, extensive travels in preaching the gospel. And he was able to step, step back into the pulpit because of the miracle of healing that he experienced in his own body. I love reading the stories of some of these, these saints of old who believed in this, but somehow it got removed from the history books. It's true. The Shantung revival in China, one of the most bizarre Baptist revivals ever, had almost every manifestation in that revival that happened in Toronto. But in the reprint of the book, all those things are removed to make it clean. Randy Clark printed the original. So you can find it. The point is, 
These signs follow those who believe. You know, when we have a healing meeting, people will say, well, you're not supposed to follow signs. Signs are supposed to follow you. Well, my response is, if they're not following you, follow them till they follow you. <laughs> it'll, you know, if, if you're in the environment long enough, it'll get on you. Yeah, that's the truth. All right, let's wrap it up. Verse 19 and 20. After the Lord had spoken to them, he, re- he was received up into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. Read verse 20 again. This is fascinating to me, and I'll tell you why before I read it. Most of the time, we will emphasize, find what God is doing and join what he is doing. But in this verse, the emphasis is different. He said, the Lord worked with them. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Sometimes nothing happens because we haven't said anything. Let me rephrase it. Anyone can boldly make a decree after God has shown up and is performing miracles. But show me the person who will make the bold decree before he comes, and I'll show you where he's going to come. The bold decree attracts him into an environment to confirm his work. Remember, this is his work. People become offended through history because somebody who's living an immoral lifestyle, you know, prays for the sick and they get healed. Well, I don't like it either, but God's confirming his word. He's not confirming the person. It's never okay, but he still will confirm his word. I actually know years ago, a, a, a woman part of this church, her husband was not a believer and someone at his workplace asked him how to get saved. And this unbeliever led his workmate to the Lord. That shouldn't be right. But he can do whatever he wants. In Psalms 115, God does as he pleases. This passage reminds me of the one in Acts 4. What is it? Verse 23, he says, take note of their threats Peter had just been released from prison. So he's praying, he says, God, take note of their threats. They've threatened that if we ever preach in your name again, they'll harm us. Take note of their threats and grant that your bond servants can speak your word with all boldness. Now, the previous chapter said they were arrested because they preached with boldness. Mm-hmm. Boldness got them in trouble. Now Peter's saying, increase that that got us in trouble. Apparently, we did it with partial boldness. We now want to go all in with all boldness. The church tends to dumb down the message so that we don't offend. Peter's saying, let's amp it up a little bit here. I didn't give you permission to be obnoxious. Take note of the threats. Grant that your bond servants can speak your word with all boldness while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I, I just want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. Let the message of the resurrected Christ boil in you until you cannot help but speak because the bold proclamation is what attracts the hand of God into impossible situations. Yes. The decree releases the hand of God. We don't control him by any means, but he's already revealed his heart to us. And he's looking for a people who will boldly declare. And so this verse ends the chapter and it ends our message this morning. They went out, preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. Every time, every time you talk, stop and talk to a friend about the Lord, every time 
you take just that moment at work or at home in your neighborhood, whatever, just to pray for a friend who is going through hell. Every time you take any one of those moments, what you're doing is you're declaring, Jesus is alive, and I want now to introduce you to the resurrected one. Everything in our relationship with the Holy Spirit is about discovering and manifesting the resurrected Christ. Everything is connected because without the resurrection, there is no forgiveness of sin. It is all connected to the resurrection. You and I are alive to illustrate he's alive. Why don't you stand? <clears throat> Jesus came, took on flesh, gave himself as a sacrifice to pay a price none of us could afford. He paid it so that the power of self-destruction would be broken off of our lives forever. He paid it. He took my place in death so I could take his place in life. He conquered death. He rose from the dead. And now we make the proclamation. Jesus is here to save. He is here to deliver. He is here to heal. Just this morning, I had a grandfather come up to me who had a grandson. They brought here for prayer some time ago. And he brought the picture with me. The grandson had autism and he's completely healed. He's taken the grandson. <clears throat> He's taken the grandson back to the original physician, and that doctor examined him and said, This is not the same child. Absolutely dramatic. We've had just this morning testimony verified by mammogram of tumors, growths that are dissolved. Just yesterday, someone came in to the healing rooms with breast cancer. The tumor dissolved, the pain is gone, completely healed. Just, just in the last 24 hours, the reports of what God has done and continues to do. There are people in this room, there's somebody who has a very serious injury to your right leg. It's, uh, it's weak, literally from the ankle all the way up to the hip. There's a weakness there. Um, I don't know if there's ongoing pain or aching, but there's a weakness there where you don't have all mobility, you don't have all use because of an injury. The Lord's healing that this morning. There are uh, various uh, individuals with tumors in your body. It is normal for tumors to disappear in the presence of the Lord. It's normal for those to dissolve in the presence. There, uh, there are people here that have no sense of smell. It was stolen from you by this demon called COVID. And the Lord's going to restore it this morning. He's going to restore the taste, the smell. There's a lot of those conditions that Jesus is healing. There's somebody who, I don't know if you broke a rib or if you have some, some sort of an issue right here, uh, this part of, of the abdominal area, you've got pain in it. I don't know if it's a growth, what it is. But there's a, there's a miracle for you uh, this morning. Um, yeah, amen. Um, but the greatest miracle of all is the one that's about to happen. And that is, Jesus arranged for you to be here. And there's some of you that are outside of a personal relationship with him. You don't know what it is to be born again. That doesn't make any sense to you. And yet you find yourself here today and the resurrected Christ is beckoning you. He's calling you by name, inviting you to come to him, to turn over your life to him. 
Jesus is Lord of all. He's the only one who has the right to rule our life. And he's this kind, wonderful father who simply longs to forgive. And if there's anybody in the room that would say, Bill, I don't want to leave the building till I know I've found peace with God, then I want you just to put your hand up right where you are. Do it quickly. Wave it at me till I see you because I want to make sure that we receive everybody in the building that wants to get right with God. We just had two at Twin View and two earlier here this morning. Anyone else? We've got people online always. We welcome you. Put in the chat line. One of our pastors will get to you. But is there anyone at all that would say, I want, to, I want to get right with God. I want to receive Jesus into my life today. All right, well, I'm going to assume you're all in. Leslie, why don't you come on up? And I want to ask, please hold your place for just a moment longer. In and out Burger, we'll wait for you, I promise us. The line will always be long no matter when you get there. So just hold, hold a moment. But I would like to have ministry team come up to the front.